Picture this. You're an IO psychologist and you're about to embark on a new project. Your mission is to create the perfect intervention that will enhance job satisfaction, performance, and overall workplace happiness. But before you can even begin, you must solve the puzzle of truly understanding the job. This is where job analysis comes in, your compass guiding you through the maze of job requirements and qualifications. There are two essential components that you need to explore, the job specification and the person specification. Think of the job specification as the blueprint of the job, detailing its tasks, duties, and responsibilities. Meanwhile, the person's specification is like a character sketch of the ideal employee, highlighting their skills, knowledge, and abilities. Remember, it's all about creating that perfect fit between the employee and the job. As an IO psychologist, job analysis is your bread and butter. Your success in designing effective interventions hinges on your understanding of the job itself. Let's say you're a detective and the job is your case. You need to gather all the clues before you can solve the mystery. To uncover the secrets of the job, you have a variety of investigation methods at your disposal. First of all, we have work-oriented methods. So these focus on the job's requirements, including the tasks that need to be done and their expected outcomes. We also have worker-oriented methods. These emphasize the worker's actions and behaviors, giving you insights into what they do and how they do it. You can use different sources of data to gain a deeper understanding of the job. Some methods rely on existing data while others generate new data. You can even categorize job analysis methods by the type of data they collect, qualitative or quantitative. Quantitative data usually comes in the form of surveys or questionnaires, providing you with hard numbers and statistical insights. On the other hand, qualitative data offers a more in-depth look at the job. So qualitative job analysis methods include, first of all, observation. So picture yourself as a job analyst stepping into the workplace and following employees around. You take notes on what they're doing and how they're doing it. And this method known as a time in motion study allows you to experience the job from an outsider's perspective. We also have job participation. In this hands-on approach, the job analysis actually performs the jobs themselves. It may not be feasible for every job. So for example, you wouldn't want a job analysis attempting open heart surgery. Job participation offers a first-hand insight into the job's requirements and challenges. And then there's employee diaries. So sometimes employees are asked to keep track of the tasks they perform throughout the day. These diaries can provide valuable information on the job's day-to-day -day activities and nuances. You can also conduct interviews with subject matter experts. Who knows a job better than the employees who do it every day? These experts, often called incumbents or subject matter experts, can offer their perspective on the tasks, responsibilities, and expectations of the job. By conducting interviews, you get the inside scoop straight from the source. Another qualitative approach to job analysis is the job element method, which is probably the simplest way of conducting a job analysis. This method focuses on gathering information from subject matter experts, so those employees who are actually doing the job. Using their input, you identify the knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics required for the job. You'll often come across the acronym KSA, which stands for Knowledge, Skills, and Abilities. Sometimes you might see KSAOs, where the O stands for Other Characteristics, or even KSATIs, or KSATIs, where the T stands for Temperament and I stands for Interest. The goal is to determine the type of person likely to succeed in a particular job, creating what we call a person specification. You've probably seen this in job ads, like we're looking for someone who communicates well, can manage a team, or is fluent in a specific language. These are all examples of KSAs that result from a job analysis. Now let's look at the critical incident technique. Here the focus is on analyzing specific situations faced in a job, identifying the best and worst ways of handling these situations. This worker-oriented approach aims to pinpoint specific behaviors that lead to successful job performance, as well as those that indicate potential failure. 
The critical incident technique emerged in the military during World War II, but has since been adopted in various industries, particularly those involving safety critical work, like aviation, mining, emergency response, or heavy machinery, where mistakes can have catastrophic consequences. In these environments, understanding how people handle specific challenges, often safety related, is critical. Information obtained using the critical incident technique helps develop behaviorally anchored rating scales, which are assessment tools for measuring the behaviors prospective employees might exhibit in specific situations. These scales are handy for creating training scenarios and interview questions for recruitment and selection processes. There are also quantitative job analysis methods. These methods are often survey-based, and while you might occasionally see custom-made surveys tailored to specific tasks and KSAs, standardized questionnaires are much more common. Perhaps the most commonly used standardized questionnaire is called the Position Analysis Questionnaire. The beauty of the Position Analysis Questionnaire lies in its versatility. It can assess a wide range of jobs, making it a go-to tool for many organizations. By evaluating factors such as decision-making, interaction with others, and physical demands, the Position Analysis Questionnaire provides a comprehensive understanding of job requirements. Another interesting approach is the Functional Job Analysis, which focuses on entire professions instead of specific jobs. This approach goes beyond individual jobs and delves into the heart of entire professions. Imagine uncovering the core tasks that define what it means to be a teacher or a nurse. This gives you a bird's eye view that can be really valuable in designing interventions. There are also more cutting edge, hybrid, qualitative, quantitative methods like competency modeling and cognitive task analysis. Competency modeling identifies the skills, behaviors, and knowledge needed for success in a particular role or industry. It's like creating a blueprint for an ideal employee emphasizing what it means to be successful, not just to do the job adequately. On the other hand, cognitive task analysis digs into the mental processes behind job performance by understanding how employees think, make decisions, and solve problems. All right, let's dive a little deeper into the most commonly used quantitative job analysis tool, the position analysis questionnaire. As an off-the-shelf questionnaire, it's a standardized tool that can be applied to analyze a wide variety of jobs without needing any modifications. The position analysis questionnaire focuses on six major components of work behavior. Let's break them down. The first is information inputs. This is all about the information a worker receives regarding a job. It could come in the form of dials or gauges in technical roles or emails or even feedback from a supervisor or coworker. Next, we have mental processes. This component deals with the decisions or judgments people need to make while performing their job. Whether it's solving a complex problem or deciding on the next course of action, mental processes play a big role. Next, we have outputs. So this is all about the end results of work. What does the work achieve when a job is done successfully? It's essential to know what success looks like. We also have interpersonal activities. This covers the communication aspect, including how frequently workers interact with others and the nature of those interactions, like in-person conversations or emails. There's also the work situation. This component is all about the work environment. So factors like noise levels, working from home, or even working outside and doing shift work are considered here. Lastly, the job context. So the job context includes things like pay, work hours, and other relevant factors that affect the overall job experience. Let's talk a bit more about functional job analysis and how it's used to create extensive databases by government bodies that describe the nature of different jobs. The original database, known as the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, was developed by the U.S. Department of Labor and covered over 40,000 jobs in the U.S. Nowadays, it's been replaced by what's called ONET, which compiles thousands of worker surveys each year and is continually updated. ONET's website offers a wealth of information about various jobs, including the relevance of different KSAs and tasks people performed. Feel free to check it out for yourself. Similarly, the Australian Bureau of Statistics has its own database, which is also worth exploring. Next, let's unpack competency modeling a bit more. 
Competency modeling is a really useful tool for standardizing culture or values and embedding them in organizational processes. Instead of focusing on average or typical performance, competency models emphasize the ideal performance that employees should aspire to achieve. Imagine the top performers in an organization and what they look like. These top performers will likely be defined differently depending on their level within the organization. So for instance, the competencies someone would need to demonstrate as a lecturer at a university would be different from those they'd need as a professor, at least regarding performance, but not necessarily in terms of alignment with the organization's values or mission. The key here is directly linking behaviors what a person should be aspiring to do in their job to the business strategy or overarching goals or values of the organization. These days, with the growing interest in organizational values and having employees aligned with those values, we're starting to see a shift towards much more competency modeling. And finally, cognitive task analysis. This approach is particularly useful when it comes to complex tasks that require high level of cognitive skill or decision making. Cognitive task analysis is an approach that seeks to uncover the thought processes, mental strategies, and decision making that go on behind the scenes when someone is performing the job. It's all about breaking down complex tasks into smaller, more manageable components and understanding how people accomplish these using their cognitive skills. This can be especially valuable in fields like aviation, medicine, or other safety critical or high stakes environments where critical thinking and split second decision making can mean the difference between success and disaster. So to wrap up our journey into the world of job analysis, we should remember that while it's an ideal first step and the foundation of much of what an IO psychologist does, it can be time consuming and costly. Smaller organizations, particularly when budgets are tight, may resort to more informal practices like brief interviews between employees and HR managers or allowing employees to develop their own position descriptions. As an organizational psychologist, it's important to balance the resources of the organization with the benefits of a thorough job analysis. Keep in mind that a well-conducted job analysis offers both short-term and long-term advantages, such as increasing efficiency, reducing stress, and providing a solid return on investment. Part of an IO psychologist's job might involve persuading organizations to invest in these benefits and understand their value. As we wrap up today's lecture, let's take a moment to reflect on the wide-ranging topics we've explored in this introduction to the world of IO psychology. We began by delving into the essence of IO psychology, discussing how IO psychologists leverage the power of scientific research and evidence-based principles to improve the workplace. Throughout the lecture, we recognize the importance of multiple levels of analysis in organizational psychology, where individuals work within groups or teams and different groups or teams operate within organizations. By understanding these different levels, we can develop a more comprehensive view of how individual emotions, attitudes, and behaviors interact with group dynamics and organizational culture. And finally, we examine the topic of job analysis, examining various methods and tools that IO psychologists use to investigate the knowledge, skills, and abilities required for different roles or occupations. This crucial process forms the foundation for many of the interventions and improvements we can implement in the workplace. Now this may be the end of the lecture, but your journey into the captivating world of IO psychology has only just begun. I'll see you all in the lecture debrief.